I've dabbled with some similar devices. This is a computer. This is totally different from what people are thinking about. By now, you've probably heard of Apple's new device, the Vision Pro Mixed Reality Headset. The device has really divided the internet. Some people think it looks goofy and is stupid, while the early impressions of those who have actually used it couldn't be more glowing. It's intuitive, rapid and responsive, has a crisper image than any headset out there, and feels like magic. Like I don't, I normally don't call tech things sort of magical or surreal like this, but this was, even for a pre-release product, kind of unbelievable how well it does. Moving around the windows, I had messages pulled up, FaceTime, Safari, is so easy. You just look at the bottom bar, you grab it, you move it. You can move it in the X or Y space, the Z space, and it works so well. So I was actually very surprised by the intuitiveness of it. It's always an amazing time when Apple releases a new product, but um, the Apple Vision Pro is the truth. The technology is there. Uh, my mind is blown. I would live here. That alone. Oh my goodness, that was... I need the emoji, mind blown. <laughs> this is what you see from me, right? We'll see exactly how this was achieved later in the episode. But the fact is, Apple really thinks that this is the next step in computing, just like the iPhone was. And when you think about it, iPhones are no longer interesting. And how can they be? There's only so much you can do with a flat, rectangular slab. It would seem like computing in three dimensions, as opposed to two, is the way of the future. But hang on. The thing is, virtual reality and augmented reality aren't new technologies, and Apple's device is heavy and expensive. So, will it actually revolutionize the technology landscape again, or is it still too early? And why is this so expensive in the first place? We'll dive into what this product really is all about. The Vision Pro isn't a traditional VR headset or AR headset. It's actually both and can fluidly move between the two states. You can use your fingers, eyes, and voice for basic tasks, a keyboard and mouse for productivity, or a controller for gaming. According to Apple, it should be smooth enough and powerful enough to overcome the main problem of motion sickness. Some viewers watching this may say, what's the point? Just go outside and touch grass. I understand, but this episode is purely an analysis on the insane technical achievements, not social commentary. Let's take a look at what makes this product so different. If those who have tried the device are right, this is the first headset to my knowledge that excels both in AR and VR at a high level. At its core, this is its unique selling point. Two of the more popular devices, the MetaQuest and PSVR, are gaming and VR focused. They have touches of AR where you can see your environment, but it's either very grainy or even just in black and white. Augmented reality devices, on the other hand, like the Vario XR3 or Microsoft's HoloLens 2, are focused on industry and productivity, and most can't even do VR at all. So Apple doing both of these well at the same time is very difficult, an engineering feat, an expensive feat at $3,500. But once you see what goes into the device, the price makes a bit more sense. To make all of this work was not easy from a design perspective. Apple went nuts in the technical innovation side of things. They went on a hiring spree over the past few years, recruiting experts in VR and AR companies and outright buying some of these companies, in some cases, even as far back as 2017. And after 5,000 patents, that technical knowledge paid off. The Vision Pro is to the iPhone as what the iPhone was to the desktop computer. That is, a new way of working with computers. Every time Apple does this, the rest of the industry follows. Apple usually aren't the ones to invent the technology, but they're great at perfecting it. This is what I mean. In the 1980s, Apple saw a problem with computers. Typing commands to make the computer do what you wanted was too hard for people. So the solution? Why not just point and click directly at what you want? This idea was borrowed from Xerox PARC. In the 2000s, Apple saw another problem. A versatile, small, portable computer is too hard to use with buttons and a D-pad. So the solution? Why not just use your fingers directly? Apple got this technology from a company called Fingerworks. And now, in the 2010s, Apple saw another problem. VR and AI headsets can be hard to use. 
the interface is inaccurate and sometimes confusing. Menus are slow to navigate and controllers are clunky. The solution, navigate with your body, specifically the parts of your body that communicate, your eyes, hands and mouth. A user can look at where they want to navigate and a simple pinch of the fingers selects and a pinch and a flick scrolls. Move anything you want anywhere in three dimensions. If that's all too much, you can simply just talk to the computer. These technologies have all existed before, but have never been put together and executed well enough. And by now, you can see the pattern. Apple sits back and waits till other tech companies make the first moves. Then they swoop in and do it better. Another way of thinking about the Vision Pro is kind of like a 3D iPhone. It might sound odd, but if you think about it, Apple did say that all iPad and iOS apps, or at least hundreds of thousands of those apps, will work with the headset. So technically, if that's true, that is like an iPhone in 3D. It seems like Apple is trying to get towards an ecosystem where all apps will work in some way on all devices. In the case of the headset, interface elements float with shadows and can be expanded and moved at will. But I was really impressed with the responsiveness. Again, this was better than any headset I've seen with just your hands. If I wanted to scroll through something like a Safari window, I literally, in air, would touch my fingers together and drag the window and it would scroll nearly in real time. I would like throw it around, like toss it, catch it, toss it the other way and start scrolling through things with my finger. And I was super impressed with that too. And if you want, you can even be transported to a large virtual environment and make the TV truly as large as you like. An interesting touch here is blending AR and VR using a crown mechanism, much like the Apple Watch. Spin the digital crown one way and you'll see more of the real world. Spin it the other and you see less. Press on the button and you get taken to the home screen. And it, again, really works like that. User-controlled immersion isn't something I've seen before, and it's another thing that sets this headset apart. Also, if users have a MacBook, all they need to do is look at it and the MacBook screen begins to float into the air and you can continue your work there in 3D space. You can view photos, videos, have multiple windows open, do documents, video editing, even view 3D messages, and basically do all the computing tasks you would otherwise do, but in a 3D environment. To make the device feel more human, when you're in an AR space, a person on the outside interacting with a user can see a simulated version of their eyes from an outward facing screen. And from the perspective of a user, people that come into your view fizzle through the 3D environment and can interact with you. Early users do say that this does work as well as the demo, but the external eyes on the headset are a tad creepy. Users can take 3D photos and videos if they wish. And I think that's kind of dumb, but others might fairly disagree. And I think that's fine. Apple managed to cram 23 million pixels into two screens so sharp that it's the equivalent of a micro LED 4K TV for each eye. And the people who have used it have all said the same thing. It's sharp and even small text is crisp enough for web browsing. And the clarity of, say, a Safari tab, you're reading an article, is so good. The words are super crisp, and I honestly felt more excited about the productivity elements to it than even the entertainment. The screens have 5,000 nits of peak brightness, and that's a lot. The MetaQuest 2, for example, maxes out at about 100 nits of brightness, and Sony's PSVR, about 265 nits. So 5,000 nits is crazy. According to display analyst Ross Young, this 5,000 nits of peak brightness isn't going to blind users, but rather provide superior contrast, brighter colors, and better highlights than any of the other displays out there today. While the M2 does all the heavy lifting, the R1 chip makes sure that it all feels realistic. The chip is capable of driving imagery at a latency of 12 milliseconds or less that's eight times faster than the blink of an eye. This should stop motion sickness, a huge barrier to most XR systems today. One of the best implemented features is the eye tracking. The most impressive thing about this headset, the most impressive thing is the eye tracking. I'm not even kidding. This, this eye tracking is sick. Move your eyes around the UI, it would immediately highlight and select exactly what you're looking at. No matter how small the target was or what you're looking at, cruising, you're sailing through everything by just looking at things. And it, it feels like telepathic. You just look at something and select it. To get the eye tracking and hand movement so precise, Apple utilized LED illumination and internal cameras to track eye movements down to a T. According to Sterling Crispin, who was a neurotechnology prototyping researcher within Apple's internal technology development group, 
The Vision Pro is a culmination of the whole industry morphed into a single product. He worked on tech that could predict if a user was going to click on something before they actually did. Apple used AI algorithms to do this. The R1 chip processes inputs from 12 cameras, 6 microphones and 5 sensors that can see forward, downwards, sidewards, in visual light, infrared and LiDAR. Okay, so it's not perfect. The Vision Pro does have some drawbacks. For one, it's too heavy to be comfortable for long periods of time, and it's not like you're going to be using it for long because it's only got a two hour battery life. The power is supplied by a battery brick, which goes in the pocket and is connected by a wire. This short battery life is probably an indication of how intensely the chips are working under the hood. And that's saying something because Apple is obsessed with efficiency. It is helpful that it can be plugged into a wall, but what it doesn't help is the fact that it's expensive, $3,500. So the question that a lot of people ask is why is it so expensive? Does Apple plan on ripping everyone off? Well, not exactly. This technology wasn't easy to design, build or produce. According to leaks, the bill of materials cost of just the components was around $1,500. So even if Apple sold this device at cost, it would still be three times more expensive than the MetaQuest or PSVR 2. And we can't overlook the R&D costs. There are multiple custom technologies in the device, a custom R1 chip, new display technology, and a completely new cooling system. This would cost Apple tens or even hundreds of billions of dollars to develop and produce. Also, for very important context, the basic Microsoft HoloLens 2 costs $3,500, and the industrial edition costs around $5,000. For Apple's case, the pricing is going to be a hard sell for consumers, especially in this economic climate. But the good news is the cost is sure to come down with future non-pro models. Ultimately, Apple's Vision Pro and its subsequent headsets are going to be drastically less popular than the iPhone. But what it will do is popularize a new way of computing. So in that regard, it will be the next iPhone. In spirit only. The human-computer interaction is what I said Apple would crack when I first talked about Apple's future AI headset three years ago. In my opinion, a great user interface experience and good apps should be a solid enough foundation and Apple could start seeing units really move by its third iteration, pending macroeconomic factors of course. Now, I could be totally wrong, and even at a lower price, people may need some convincing to put on a headset regularly. It really is a time where all of that future technology that we dreamed of as kids is starting to come into existence. It's just wild. As cool as all of this is, purely from a technical sense, I can't help but wonder what happens in the future. If headsets like this improve in size and weight, is it going to contribute to the loneliness problem? It could be a less prevalent, but still existing, new form of smartphone addiction. It's way too early to tell, but it's still something I just thought about. So let me know your thoughts. If you want to see extended thoughts on this, check out the latest episode of the Through the Web podcast, where we express our opinions in more detail. Okay, so thanks for watching. My name is Dagogo, and you've been watching Cold Fusion, and I'll catch you again soon for the next episode. Cheers, guys. Have a good one.